So today I am joined by uh, David Nash, and he's uh, he's actually uh, authoring a, a book very soon. He's writing a book, and it's called From the Dressing Room to the Boardroom. And I'm pleasured uh, also to be joined by Michael Tobin again. Mike, you. It, it's you, not. Uh, it's not often that I get um, thanked for, for pleasuring someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can I say? <laughs> there is always a first, Mike. <laughs> Here it is. Oh, are you still wearing the BA pyjamas? They're different ones, but, you know. All right. <laughs> it's maximizing okay. value, you know. <laughs> I've got a whole wardrobe full of them. At this rate, I'm going to have more, more BA pyjamas than BA's going to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Send a few back to them, mate. Do them a favour. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> i know that you've you've moved beyond cricket uh to become an entrepreneur right and you, you're moving into being an author but you've obviously been through some struggles along the way and this is kind of you know um important i think for the for the listeners out there right so what what do you think like were the biggest struggles that you went through in 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 your career that's helped you to get where you are now for, for me i think it was um the mental my mental struggles and my anxieties um it, when i played at middlesex it was a very hard school and um things like mental health were just that they were just nothing it just never got spoken about it was you know that was just a sign of weakness you were just weak and i remember the first time i went to my doctor and sort of said look I'm struggling to see the ball and you know when the ball's coming in I'm just easy simple throws I'm not able to judge it and the doctor just sort of said to me oh you're dehydrated take some more you know take some more water on board so I was drinking more and more water and it would just kick in I didn't know what was happening to me but what was happening was I was having panic attacks when I was out in the middle and uh you know and I've as I've sort of went on I was able to sort of um deal with that but but definitely the mental health struggles of, uh, of playing cricket um, were massive for me. And uh, particularly fearing failure, letting my parents down, um, just letting myself, then letting my family down. But just, just, the, just the fear of failure was, was massive. And I'm not proud to say it, you know, it got so bad that at times I, I would just be having a panic attack. I wouldn't know how to deal with it. So I would just feign injury. So I would generally do the hamstring ones. The great thing about the hamstring, even if you just do a grade sort of one hamstring or a grade, you know, grade two or whatever, you can't, you can't basically tell unless it's a really, really bad one where all the bruising comes out. You can strain it and there could be no real, the physio might not be able to exactly tell. So um, that was the one that I no normally went for. And uh, I did that four or five times in my career and, uh, but, but at the end of the day, I knew it wasn't right and I knew I should be giving the game away. But when you've got nothing and when you've got no skills and you've got really nothing going for you going forward or, or, or that's what you, exp what, which, what you feel, it's very hard to, to give away. So you just, you muddle there's, through. There's two things there, Nashi. I mean, so first of all, I mean, you were a good player, right? So, so for you to have anxiety about, you know, not, not performing on the pitch, and you're a good player, you know, imagine that this must be something that's, you know, that's not uncommon within, no. within sports. This is, this is the thing. It, it only came, came out when I'd pretty much finished that people were starting to come out like about it. People like Marcus Droscothic, Jonathan yeah. Trott, Freddie Flintoff, you know, I, I played throughout all the age groups of Freddie and played in, went on England A tour with him um, to Sri Lanka. And you'd never, you'd never think Freddie would be one that would suffer with mental health, but, he suffered that much that even now he's not drinking because he, he knows that when he then gets back on the booze, that will then affect his mental health. And to be totally straight with you, I've been off the booze for five months now and I don't think I'm going to go back to it. Is that because you can't get out to the off license? Is that? It's A, I can't get out to Nat's off license in, Ch in uh, Chertsey. Oh, it closed it, down. And, and it, it closed down. And, it, and it's B, I just, <laughs> and it's B, I just, I, uh, on on booze my anxiety goes through the roof and uh i just don't want to be feeling like that again it's just you know i have i let myself have two or three non-alcoholic beers every night and i haven't had an anxiety attack um since i've been off the booze oh wow I tell you what, though, so I mean, I mean booze generally um so I, I i try to limit in lockdown i try to limit drinking to sort of friday saturday sunday um because uh, like 
before I didn't used to drink at home at all unless we had guests and now we're at home it's kind of like <laughs> so so I try and only only drink are you wearing shorts Nash? I am, mate. I'm wearing shorts. I'm just about to go after this. I'm out in the garden uh, on the su on the sunbed reading my book. Going through well, my book. I tell you what, I'm so happy, I'm so happy you're actually wearing shorts because it wouldn't be it wouldn't be unusual for you to have nothing. On. <laughs> no, oh yeah, I've heard about that. <laughs> didn't you? Didn't you do? Didn't you used to take interviews with the press when you were in the dressing room, like wearing like a well, I've, a towel I've been and that. known to be very casual. I mean, one of the things I sort of put in the book that's one of my biggest, one of my biggest learnings about um, about sports and business, effectively, was when I did a. Uh, it rained at the end of one of our games, and it was absolutely sodden. There was puddles on the outfield, and we were having a couple of beers in the changing room. And one of the lads, Phil Tufnell, turns around and went, "Oh, that's perfect, perfect turf out there to do the old Jurgen Klinsmann dive." And I said, yeah, I love the Jürgen Klinsmann dive. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll go out and do a naked little uh, run onto the turf and do the Klinsmann dive. So we, the, boys said, the boys all chipped in. So I got together about 240 quid, 20 quid a man with the old 12th man in as well. And, um, <coughs> and uh, went out, did the Jürgen Klinsmann dive. Both teams were on the balcony. I'm nutty. There was still a few press in the ground, so it got in the it got in the paper the next day. I got back into the changing room. I knew I was then in a lot of trouble uh, when Tuppers basically came up to me and said, "Nashi, if they try and sack you for this, mate, don't worry about it. I'll back you." And that was when I thought, <laughs> "Shit, a I'm in trouble, and b I've learned whatever you do, make sure you get the money up front because <laughs> I never got paid." <laughs> oh, no, that, no, that, is, that is very sound advice for all businesses there, to be honest, isn't it? I mean, as, yeah. as, your, business, as your business at the moment, it must be really tough. Oh, it's, You're in it's hospital. absolutely yeah. buggered at the moment. I mean, we, before it, and you know, when we set up this business, um, the idea was to give back um, whilst also you know, giving us some kind of life. And we've raised 20 million since inception when we started the business nine years ago for charity from, from my mum and dad's spare, spare bedroom. And we've got 40 staff of which most of those are now furloughed. Oh. But being truthful, I don't think everything we do is around mass gatherings. So last year we did 180 mass gatherings events. I can't see mass gatherings being back in until at least January and February are right off for us anyway, because there's very few events. So I'm thinking that we're not going to be back, back up and running until at least March, April next year. Yeah, that's probably so about right. it's going to be it's going to be absolutely brutal for us. In that time, we're still paying for rent um, because our landlord's giving us absolutely nothing. We're still paying for all things that you can't get out of, like Salesforce and stuff like that. So uh, it's it's a real, real tough time. We're pro we're projecting about a three hundred thousand pound loss next year, and that for a small <sighs> business is is pretty pretty hard to wear. But but we will get through it. And do you, do you think you come back um, after this or do you, are you going to call this a, um, a sort of a watershed moment and try and think about, you know, going into authoring as a, as a career now? I, well, as I said to Nat earlier, um, before we went on air, um, I failed my A-level English. So <laughs> just, uh, I mean, one of the boys texted me, Ben Hutton, uh, his old man, obviously Len Hutton, the grandson of Len Hutton, Middlesex, Ben was my captain, one of my many captains at Middlesex. He sent me a WhatsApp the other day when I sort of sent out the first sort of eight chapters of my book. He, he sent me a WhatsApp saying, Dog, give, give, give me a shout if you need any help on the spellings. <laughs> <laughs> to which I put back um, a bit, uh, not a nice reply, but, um, but it, it, did, it did make me chuckle. But authoring, I don't think it's something, it's a one and only. I won't be doing any more, but I've really enjoyed it. And I think it's just the reason I've done it is I just wanted a, a something to do at a time that we are, we are not doing too much. And B, um, obviously, I think it's a great legacy um, for the children and, and reading your books, Mike, you know, I really loved it. I loved reading them. And I just I just thought it was one of those things in life, a bucket list thing to do. But I won't be doing more than the one. Well, it'd be, it'd be nice if you can do the audio book as well, because that, that's a, a really a real fun experience that I found. So I did my own audio and um, you sit yourself, I, there was this um, uh, small sort of studio I went to in Tottenham Court Road called Cheapest Chips. There's a <laughs> brilliant where my priorities are. Um, but, um, but basically, you sit there in a, in a soundproof room and the, and, the, and the editor's literally live with you and you're just reading your book. And, um, and, and actually, post, 
Now, bear in mind, you know, it was, it was published by a proper um, publisher and it had been proofread and edited and edited again and all this sort of stuff. And when I was really, only when I read it out loud did I think, hang on a minute, that bit don't make sense. <laughs> but there's one paragraph in the book that's completely different on the audio version than it is in the book. It's like, this is bullshit when you read it like this. <laughs> 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 reading it on the page without making noises is very different to when you're actually reading it and you're trying to intonate like you're talking as well yeah brilliant of course <laughs> <laughs> it's good though writing a book i wrote one and like i i, I didn't get gcse uh, english and i had an english teacher and he would tell me i'd be cleaning toilets that's what he would say to me and and he and he said and i didn't write anything legible till i was 35 I, I read the book by Seth Godin uh, called The Icarus Deception. And uh, I don't know if Mike's heard this story, actually. He might have. But so I read this book called The Icarus Deception. And it basically tells you that you need to basically just build your own audience because someone's going to like find it useful and, and helpful. So I was like, right, then I'm going to get stuck in. And it took it, it took about. Let me see, about three years probably. And then IBM said, oh, we want you to write some blogs for our, our new blog called Think Marketing, which was like a blog that they were doing. And we're going to pay you like a dollar a word. So I got paid like a Jesus. dollar a word for like, uh, so yeah, I was like, well, I was like, wow, like, yeah, let's have some of that. And then, and then after, so Seth Godin was the guy who actually wrote some of the introductory articles for this new blog that they launched. And he, and he basically, yeah, so he actually wrote some of the articles and I was featured in that blog, but unfortunately they changed marketing manager and shelved the project. That's yeah. the so they deleted the whole, the whole thing. They spent like a quarter of a million plus on that Jeez. and then <laughs> killed it. I, I think in all honesty, now they'll probably be paying me a dollar a word to put a red pen through it, mate. Online. <laughs> It'll Online. be brilliant. It'll be brilliant. Don't be negative. Come on, man. <laughs> Oh, what's the marketing uh, manager I've sent it to Mike by... so he can give me some honest feedback <laughs> what's the marketing manager at my IBM was that your brother Nat was it no 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 <laughs> my brother's not IBM he was at Cisco he's in sales <laughs> Mike sales <laughs> oh, cheek I'm gutted now I'm gutted I spent I'm gutted now spent thousands of hours learning how to write <laughs> and I still get ripped up but my business partner, he's called Mike as well, and he gives me abuse about my about my English. So I really wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so I've got another question. Got another question for you, uh, David. So, do you think that pre uh, playing professionally has enabled you to be more successful in business? I think I don't have too many skills to my skill set. To be totally honest with you, now. Um, I have one skill and that is people. Um, I'm great with people. I love people. Um, I love people that succeed. Um, and generally I think people take to me because I think I'm just very honest and I, I just try never to let anyone down. And the, the times that I, I have let people down, like uh, one of our clients bid food, we let them down on our first, um, first event we did for them in the fact that we, we got their branding wrong on the day, which was a total muck up. And I went basically up to the marketing director and said, look, please fire me. I'm embarrassed and, uh, you know, I'm really sorry. And they gave us another opportunity and they've been a client for us um, all the way through now. And, uh, you know, it's been great. So I think the key thing for me is hold your, hold your hands up when you mess up. And um, just be true to yourself, be straight, be open, be transparent and, you know, uh, never let anyone down. And for, for me, uh, ask, ask for the deal. I mean, Don, I stick my three things. Don McCarthy, um, who was a great businessman, um, he was chairman of House of Fraser, who gave us our first opportunity in business. And when I went to see him to basically just sort of say, how can I sort of grow the business? And, you know, what, what are your words of advice? He said simply, Nashi, keep it very simple. Get great people around you. Go with your gut feel and, and wear your best suit when you see your bank manager. <laughs> I like the last one. I like the last one. Yeah, no, that, that's true. I mean, having great people around you is, is, is absolutely critical. And, and I think a lot of people in business, um, coming back to the insecurity thing, right? A lot of people in business don't tend to recruit people that they feel intimidated by, right? And, and I think that's, you know, what you need to do is find the absolute best person that you can for every single role. And then just don't try and tell them how to do their role. Just give them 
a vision of where you want the business to go and let them, they'll find the way because they're better at their role than you are. That's why you employ them. And then they will find their way to, to deliver on that. And I think that's, that's the kind of way to, you know, really excel at business as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you said something interesting, Mike, the other day about, um, or maybe last week, about uh, finding people who have not the qualifications, but the right mindset. And I thought that was really quite interesting, actually. Absolutely. You, you've got to, so I, I can teach a skill, but it's very, very hard to teach an attitude. And so I want someone that, you know, getting things wrong is normal. Right? Getting things wrong in life is normal. That's obviously why, um, you know, your, 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 your guy gave you another chance at the, at the gig, right? Because mm. things go wrong in life, you know, and, 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 you know, we, at home with the kids, I try, we, we have a kind of a rule that we don't use the word failure and we don't use the word um, mistake. We just say there's either success or learning. Yeah. Brilliant. Looking at it like that, then, then, you know, the, the, the negatives are positives in a sense that you're learning from them how not to do something. Mm. Spot on. Well, yeah. I, it's worked for me. <laughs> no, no, it's spot on. Um, also that you know because I've got very little skills I have to have a lot of drive and determination because no one's going to employ me so if I don't do it myself basically our fa my family doesn't eat yeah it's a fair point as well you've yeah. got to have that determination and I think that's one of the most important things in, in, in life generally is resilience right so mm. you know, uh, when I was doing a tour of um, Ellis, uh, Robin Island um, in, in Cape Town where um, Mandela was, was incarcerated for 20, was it 27 years? Um, yeah. and, um, and there's a thing on the wall and, and it's like they, they, used, they used to hammer away at these big stones. That was their job every day in the courtyard was just literally hammering big rocks to break them into small rocks. And it was designed to be monotonous and everything else. But... You know, they couldn't move on until they'd broken it. And, and he said, what I noticed was it didn't matter how many times with these tiny hammers that you hit the rock, eventually you knew that one of them was going to break the rock, but you just didn't know which hit was going to break the rock, right? So you, you kind of got this concept of never giving up on the basis that you know that after that one, yeah. failed, that one failed, that one failed, you just don't know whether the next one will do it. Mm. you know and every time he said then the amount of times over 27 years that that lesson was ingrained in him was simply you know oh this thing's never going to break clunk you know yeah and so and so that that's a kind of a, an ethos that he had is continuously getting up and getting up and getting up and making sure that you don't give in resilience is super important it's awesome. massive no spot on yeah yeah and you bring that you bring that from your sport right into into business i mean it, you know, you don't just become a, a really great cricket player overnight, right? Like you, you have to hone your skills, yeah? Yeah, I, I think I was definitely someone that um, had more... I had more talent than, than what I achieved. I, I, was a, um, I was a bit of a waste of talent, I think. I got things wrong a lot. Um, I got in with the wrong crowds. Um, but back then, it wasn't a very professional sport. So there are always off-field distractions. You know, nowadays the players go to their hotel room, they eat in their hotel room. There's no socialising really. You know, they have their urine tests in the morning. Everything's done for them. And they're, you know, basically the whole going out and enjoying yourself is taken out of the equation. Whereas in our day, it was more, more of a amateur type sport that you were getting paid for. And you were basically at university, but playing cricket with your mates. Yeah. That was what it was pretty much like. And uh, I fell into that trap. And I think I fell out of love with the game. And uh, I just I just loved the lads. And I just loved being around the lads. Yeah, and having fun, you know. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's quite an interesting sport, though. I mean, like, I can't play cricket very well. Yeah, I was like on the third team or something when I was at school. I wasn't exactly, uh, you know, very good at it. But uh, it, it sort of... It sort of um, it was quite in, it's a, quite a fun game because you can you can have a beer and you can socialise and have a chat. There's a lot of time where you can talk to the guys and and and, and sort of bond, right? And I mean, I, I hate to think what it was like back in the day because my my great great uncle he he actually uh, was a was a captain of England back in the day, and 
uh, I dug out a Wikipedia about it because I don't know a huge amount about that part of the family. It's my mum has been going on about it for years. And, <laughs> and, and uh, Francis George Mann um, was, uh, was born in Byfleet. And uh, yeah, he, he basically, um, let me see, his father, Frank Mann, also captain uh, England. And can you imagine what it was like back in those days? Oh. Of, I mean, the, the, was it more formal, do you think, or, or less formal? I, I, I just think it was, must have been an absolute party, just getting on the boat to blimmin' Australia in those days. I mean, how long would that have taken just to get there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. my God, imagine the parties on that boat. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> God, it must have been an absolute... I bet, the, uh, I bet they're, with their England blazers on, the female numbers on the ship would have been through the roof. <laughs> of course. God. Of course. More wives than you on that boat, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> you think about it, it must have been a miracle that anyone won a, won a touring match because, you know, coming off a boat, you know, oh. no wonder the Ashes became so important because if you tried to win the Ashes away from home in those days, after kind of being on, being on a boat for a month and then, you know, getting scurvy or whatever you, you'd get in those days <laughs> and then trying to play cricket. The opening bowl is right. probably two stone heavier by the time he gets there. <laughs> that's a really good. That's a really good point, actually. It, yeah. it would have been quite fun, though, wouldn't it? I mean, oh, awesome. They're probably sitting there with their cigars, you know, right up to when they, you know, stub the stub the cigar out on the way out of the dressing room when you go out the bat. And... <laughs> Well, that side of the family were all they were from from the Man Brewery, you see. So they they were right into right into all of that mm. sort of cigars and port after dinner sort of clan, you know. <laughs> I, I sat three spots away from Phil Tufnell. He used to do that before he batted as well, Mike. That, that, that was only about ten years ago. Uh, what the port, the port and the cigars, or, or just the beers? He'd be putting the old smoking out the window, <laughs> out the window of the change room with all his kit on, absolutely. Looking like he was about to go to his death. <laughs> now, Nashi, we've lost. We, oh, you're back again. There he is. Yeah. A bit there. there he is. So, uh, well, you just just had a bit of a scratch there, did you? you no, I've got. <laughs> sorry, I'm on my iPhone. People calling me. People calling me. Trying to interrupt me. It's all right. This is this is this is, this is fine. This is this is normal. We have to take yeah, it as it no, comes. Nat's right? not really in front of a mountain range either. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> And I actually want those chairs. That those are on my bucket list. Yeah, they're like, nice. They yeah. look expensive. Yeah, they. Are. If you get the originals, they're about. I think they're about. They're about between six and ten k each. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Plus the footstool. I want. I want. What I want to definitely. You've researched this, haven't you? <laughs> oh yeah. My sister. My sister and her husband. They've actually got. They've actually got those with the footstools, uh, out in San Francisco. She works at Intel, and he works at Google. He manages she, like the she data centers. Work at IBM, does she? No, yeah, she works at Intel. That's what I was going to say. You want to no. speak to that IBM marketing manager again? <laughs> no, I th I'm not sure that particular marketing manager will be there. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what happened there. We're not going. We're not going down that route, guys. Okay, <laughs> you get me in big trouble. <laughs> so, Nashi, Nashi, what's what's one of your most memorable sporting sporting achievements? You must have a lot there. My right. most memorable sporting achievements. Well, we were talking about it the other day on a Zoom with all the sort of Middlesex group from the 95 to the 2005 era, which was all my peers like your Andrew Strausses, your O.A. Shards, your Nick Comptons, all people like Owen Morgan, all those sort of guys. We were a lot of youngsters basically coming through at, together, but um, we'd come off the 95, uh, the 85, 95 era of, Gatting, Tufnell, Ramprakash, Fraser, Embry, Desmond Haynes, legends of the game where they all had pretty much 11 internationals and they were very, very successful. We were then, we got them on the back end of their careers when they were on their way down, on the way out. And us, as us youngsters were coming through, they, were, they just threw a load of us youngsters in and we weren't ready. We weren't ready. We, we, we just weren't hardened pros. So effectively, our, our sort of um, era, was an era of um, you know transition and and we didn't we didn't we didn't play well you know we came second a few times we won the T20 that was great um, but we um, you know went to Stanford 2020 went out there to the Stanford when 
because Middlesex won the T20 and uh, Alan, good old Alan Stanford. I mean, we were meant to go to his house on a Wednesday night for a party. Um, and then we were basically told the party was off and we thought, oh, that was a bit weird. And uh, then, then we'd heard, and this is only alleged, I don't know what <laughs> truth is in this, that, that he'd come to his house and seen that his captain of the Stanford 2020 team's not naming names uh, with his wife. So I don't know any mm. if there's any truth in that. But, okay. um, you know, looking through the, the great moments of my life, I was lucky to have Lords as my office for 15 years. And uh, I've played with so many amazing players, the likes of, you know, Langer, Jacques Callis, Glenn McGrath in my team. And, uh, you know, played against some great players like your Laras, your Shane Warnes, your Mar Marilithrans. But, you know, I wouldn't say that necessarily, obviously I played for England A, so I played for my country. I played England under 15, 17s, 19s. But I definitely would say I had an unfulfilled um, career as far as... Um, you know, amazing cricketing moments. Because if I'm totally honest, I just I just didn't live up to to what I what I should have been. Yeah, I was thinking about that earlier actually, because I did a bit of research on you. Obviously, not too much, but enough to enough to kind doesn't of take, doesn't take long. No. Well, <laughs> look, I'm sorry, Mike, but I'm just busy. Like you know. <laughs> <laughs> probably not as busy as you but there we go so anyhow i did yeah i did a bit of research on you and um and i i, I did want to talk about that but i, I didn't want to i didn't want to ask you a question around that um until you brought it up because it would be impolite yeah so so do you think that actually has helped you in your business career to make you more determined to be more, not a perfectionist but to be to be successful because i think for me yeah. I, i'm similar in many ways in, in that respect actually but not in a sporting environment well perhaps that as well actually what what i've learned i've learned um a lot about leadership and i've learned from my time at middlesex in in the main how how not to do it i mean the best leader i have at middlesex bar none was andrew strauss he was amazing that man was the best communicator I've ever met. He was amazing and he'd make you feel amazing even when you were doing poorly. But I had a guy at Middlesex who was my coach for many years, a guy called Ian Gould, who's a famous umpire. And he was a bully. And uh, he yeah. started my anxiety. He started my depression. I just didn't want to be around that guy. And he, I, I think he affected my cricketing life. And to this day, he wouldn't, but he probably wouldn't see it. He wouldn't believe it. But, you know, as a club, we did, we did shocking things. I saw some shocking behaviours in my time. I, you know, from, from, the, from the, the morning warm-up playing, playing football, um, we'd have whites up one end and ragheads up the other end. And no one ever stood up to these people. They mm -hmm. never stood up to it. And do you know what? Um, it's in the book. And I just saw, poor, I had really poor leadership in that time. It affected me. And I think um, I wasn't able to come back from it. And I wasn't strong enough to stand up to it. But what I've learned from it and learned from some of those poor experiences I've taken into my business life and tried to do the right thing and things around marginal gains. We had some great, you know, coaches, people like John Buchanan, who um, Richard Pybus, amazing coaches, you know, co coached Australia for years. Pibus coached um, South Africa, West Indies, very successful coaches. These people were, were trying to bring in the marginal gain. So little things like Richard Pibus would get us to take our own pillows to away games and we'd, we'd all be in a room and we'd relax, have a relaxation techniques and stuff like that. He was before his time, whereas then all our senior players were, didn't like Buchanan and Pibus because they then, it, they were taking things away from them that they felt that, they deserved by being first team cap players, things like single rooms on away trips. John Buchanan took them away from the senior players like Mike Gatting, Mark Rampakash, these, these legends of the game, because they were then all of a sudden having to room with the youngsters like myself and O.A. Shah, people like that. And they, they were, so the senior players obviously didn't like that and it, it upset them. And they, the senior players were the ones that got the likes of Pybus and Buchanan dismissed very quickly. And that, unfortunately, was, was uh, um, affected the club going forward. 
Well, I, I think the this this marginal gain thing is is now prevalent in in all sport, right? I mean, you know, they go to incredible detail. Um, you know, the tr eye training as well. So, you know, you, you have eye doctors that kind of make sure that your eye muscles are moving in the right directions and are quick to move from from one aspect to another. And especially in cricket, where you know, obviously, hand-eye coordination is is critical. Um, but but yeah, I mean, the, the progress in that area has been been immense. But it just feels, you know, I, I guess listening to you there it does feel like it's a there must have been a, a lot of people that were in the same boat as you that that, that could have been oh. um you know at next level the, we lost so the, much talent to it yeah. and do, do you know what i think ian gunner you know i love gunner's company he's a very very funny man he's a brilliant umpire but he affected a lot of people and it was that bullying culture you know it just you know andrew strauss will tell you you know, it affected him as well. And uh, it, yes, it was a different era then. I, I totally accept that it was a different era. And, you know, it sounds like an excuse and I hate excuses, but it definitely affected me. So how, how, do, you, how do you communicate all that knowledge to your kids now then? Well, all I ask my kids is basically be true to themselves and be, be the best that they can be every day. And, uh, and put other people first. I think that's the key. And yes, you know, Ian Gould and people like that, they had a lot of cheap laughs at a lot of us youngsters' expenses, you know, at our expense in front of the senior players that, you know, it just, just make people feel good. The only way you're going to get the best out of them if you make them feel good. Mm. And rather than, you know, I was losing my hair at the time as an 18-year-old and it just ripped the piss out of me from my barnet and stuff like that. And I'd just be like, you know, it, it, it's not going to help my performance, is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I think piss taking is important in sport, but not not from your coach. Don't take the piss out of people's performance as well. You right. know, that is that's dear to us all. I don't go out of there to, out there to try and do a poor day's work when I'm on the cricket field. I go out there to give my best, and uh, I think I almost rebelled against it with the drinking because I'd almost sort of it was my almost fuck you to be honest. Yeah, I mean, if if you, I mean. Um... If you look at what's happening at the moment, you know, the, 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 with the government and, 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 the, um, and the press, you know, it doesn't really matter what, whether it's left or right or what, what, the, what the government is of the day, but pretty much everything that government tries to do, the press are out there to kind of hound them. And I often think to myself, is like, does that person intentionally come in every day to do a bad job? Well, of course they don't. Nobody, you know, nobody intends to do a bad, you know, comes into the office, whether that's in, in, in Westminster or whether it's in, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a tech company, no one comes in and goes, right, I'm really, I really want to screw something up today. I really want to be bad. You know, they mm -hmm. come in and try and do the best they can do, right? And, and so positive criticism or, or, you know, something that, that people can take away as, as improvement, I think is good. But, but really, you know, being abusive about it, I think is quite difficult. To, yeah. Yeah. But it, I mean, it's, it's um, but, you know, I think the other thing about sort of, um, yeah, Mickey taking and that sort of thing that is rife in, in especially in cricket and the, and the sort of the sledging and stuff. I think, I think a lot of it depends on, on the, on the relationship of the two individuals, right? So, um, you know, you and I could take the Mickey out of each other because yeah. we, we know that there's a, there's a depth of, of fondness before that. Um, but, but it's where there isn't that other kind of level. Yeah. Of there's a line. I agree totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like bullying at school, right? Like it, that's where it's sort of it's sort of come from, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. it, it, and and you either you either are a bully or you get bullied, or sometimes you become a bully because you were bullied, and it's the only way to defend yourself. And I don't I don't think that the awareness was there back then, you know, of that. Mm. I mean, I didn't become aware that I was a bully or had been bullied. Um, uh, and switch between the two. I didn't realize the big picture until you, you get older. I mean, it's a, it's just life, right? Like, and that's, it's, it's just the you way it is. Now Mike bullies me. Look, he's going to rip me up now. You consider yourself a bully now. I didn't realize you, you felt that. I was a bully, but I, but I, but then I got bullied, you know, and, mm. uh, and, and. Were you held back a long time at school? Is that, is that why you could do that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I can't even give you the middle finger yet yeah, because it fell off. I've got a 3D middle finger. That my mate made me this hand, yeah, and it's got a 3D middle finger, but it's fallen off, and I can't even give my the middle finger. It's... 
I bet they work for IBM and all, didn't they? No, no. <laughs> We're not talking about IBM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Actually, you know, 3D printing is the way forward, I must admit. Because um, I, I reckon, you know, that you can, you can get anything now 3D printed. And, and um, you know, thinking about the travel, because you're all in lockdown, right? I don't suppose you've been out much, uh, uh, Nashi, but um, no. imagine, you know, if, if we're, at the moment we're relying on deliveries and stuff, right? But I think over time, we'll all have a little 3D printer in the house. And if you need something, you just print it yourself, and you'll pay for the you'll pay for the design code come through on an email, and then print it yourself. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then we won't even need deliveries. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And when you order something from IKEA, half of it's going to come in a box. The other half, you print yourself, you stick it all together. I mean, it's exactly. It's exactly. a no-brainer, right? So yeah. what's so, going to happen? What's going to happen with the world going forward, guys? What do we feel? I'm excited. I think I, I, I was, I was, I was talking to someone uh, the other day, uh, yesterday, and he was, he was basically saying that, you know, um, who's that chap? That, oh, there's, there's this really, really famous kind of prolific entrepreneur in America. And he was saying how that, you know, nowadays the businesses that are going to come out of this are going to be the next wave of, of Uber and Airbnb. And, you know, I mean, there's it, a whole new load of startups that are just going to go, like this i mean literally it's crazy really well i think i think we were already starting to see um you know uber being used as a verb as well as a noun right because you know businesses are being ubered because yesterday they weren't there now they are there and 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 suddenly um traditional business models that are that were doing well before are struggling today and i think this has just accelerated that whole process right and, and there'll be people out there I mean, it's interesting because, you know, since the 2007, 2009 financial crisis, there are a lot of Uber, just speaking of Uber, there are a lot of Uber drivers that were ex, from, the, from the financial industry, that, that suddenly the whole industry shrunk so much that the people had to find alternative work. So they, they started driving Ubers. But now driverless cars are going to come along, right? And Uber drivers are not going to have a job anymore because mm. cars won't need to be driven, right? And, and if you think about in the US, the, the, the single biggest... Um, job you know if you if you take um taxis and freight and and buses is driving mm. so the single largest employee category in the u.s is gonna is gonna be it's not gonna be here in 30 years mm. jesus it's quite interesting when you think about it that way right so um mm. finding kind of being flexible finding alternate ways to 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 to, to deploy skill sets is really really important yeah. Mm. And, you know, there are two types of people right now. There are the people who really don't know what the hell to do. And then there are the people that are like, well, OK, I, I might I might be out of work now, but I'm going to change. And they're changing very quickly what they're doing. And you can you, you, you either sit there and, and, and you know, embrace uh, the pain uh, and do nothing, which it can be it can par paralyze you. I mean, the fear of everything, it can paralyze you totally. Um, and sometimes you need, you need help to get away from, to get away from that. But then the other people are like, well, okay, I've got enough money in the bank for, for a while. I'm going to, I'm going to get on with changing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really positive about it, but you know, it's tough. I mean, it's tough for everybody. Really. Yeah. yeah. No, I must admit it's, um, you know, if it, it's, it's good if you can flex your skill sets. And obviously, as you say, if you, if you, if people that don't know, don't know what they're going to do next. I mean, the only option for them is to start a podcast, really, isn't it? Well, or two <laughs> or three. I mean, it's no need to be rude, Mike. <laughs> I did that five years ago and I still don't know what I'm doing next. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you do very well now. Yeah. Did I'm you get your own back here, Mike? Was your brother bullied by that at school or something? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I didn't go to school. Ah, I got expelled too. So, hey, you know, it is what it is, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's quite interesting. You've got three entrepreneurs on this, on this program. Um, none of them actually sort of did particularly well at school and none of them, you know, played, played much of a kind of an academic card. Yet through hard graft, flexibility, uh, mm. persistence, um, you know, that sort of stuff. Those are, those are the criteria that are going to shine through in this, in this environment. Yeah. Also, you do need a little bit of luck and opportunity. Yeah. I think uh, the one thing that I was able to do was basically how we got our sort of first deal. Would I'd go? I would take tickets to events that CEOs would be at, and I'd basically just go up to the table. I'd Google. I'd look at the guest list, 
Google their picture and go up to their table and say, look, I think I've got something that's great for your business. Someone gave you your opportunity. Can you please give me mine? And nice. I got the meeting with John King at House of Fraser and, uh, and then we were away. Nice. I think sometimes though, you can just be two, one or two millimeters away. And, and it's almost like until you're ready and you, 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 you get to that point of, right, I'm really ready for this. You don't, the success doesn't just come like you, you, you think, Oh, I really need this. I really need it. And it's like, well, no, you need to become the person that you need to be in order to get to that success. It's kind well, of, so that, it's like that little hammer on the rock again. Right. So you don't know when. The, so, so um, when I, when I first learned to, 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 to sell um, the guy that taught me happened to be Brian Adams's cousin. <laughs> Not him again. <laughs> It's another story, but, um, but, but, you know, so, so the, the, the point was that you, you, if, if you're a broom salesman and you have a hundred doors in front of you, um, and I think I've mentioned this to, to you before now, and, and, you know, you don't know which of those doors is going to hold the, 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 get the customer that you're going to sell this broom to, but you know, on average, you sell one broom to every hundred, hundred houses. So the quicker you can start knocking on houses, doors, and open up, say, no, nah, Oh, and slam the door. That, that is a positive, right? Because you know that by, by the law of your own stat statistics, you're going to get to that sale. So you have mm -hmm. to go through the nose. You have to kind of hit lots and lots of times before you get to that. You know you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think thinking about that as a positive is really important. Yeah. yeah. Persistence, resilience. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's hard work, though. I mean, you've got to do something. You, you, nothing falls out of the sky and lands, lands in, your, yeah. in your lap. I mean, you, yeah. you hone your skills, right? Like, yeah. it, it's, it's, there, There's a lot of people that think it does, though, and that's what I hate. I hate people that don't share in other people's successes. Me and too. there's a lot of people that love running people down. The amount of times I've been at my pub and just heard people like chatting about sport and going, oh, I could have been a professional footballer. I could have been this. I could have been that. Well, fucking why won't why aren't you? <laughs> I'm gonna have to put an R rating you know on I mean? this. It, it really gets on my tits. It really does. <laughs> this is an R rated show now. You know, you made me do that. I'm gonna have to click that button in iTunes now. Big trouble, mate. <laughs> Last time I fought a cricketer on here, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if I'd have known that, I'd have been a bit fruitier from the beginning. <laughs> Got a few choice words for Nashi. <laughs> so 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 people if they want to find you uh, david how how yeah. do they get hold of you um either on my, on my mobile o double seven six eight five five eight zero eight six or on email <laughs> dnash at dggrp.com i'd love to hear from anyone i'd love to hear entrepreneurs with their business ideas because one thing i'd love to do going forward is do a bit of investing into uh businesses like you know small businesses where people have got that desire and ambition to be something super i'm impressed you gave out your phone number then. so am i yeah it's all in the book as well i've done my phone number in the book as well wow. and the email <laughs> exactly for the same reason wow. fantastic fantastic super well thanks mike pleasure thanks david <laughs> Matt, lovely to meet you mate and Absolute you pleasure